human beings to every destination uh, in the solar system, right? So nuclear electric propulsion is something that we understand from both a physics perspective and an engineering perspective. Uh, and if we had the, you know, if we had the the, the due diligence and the uh, tenacity, we could pursue this and then enable a power and propulsion system that could that could allow humans go, to go to every planet in the solar system and also enable what we call interstellar precursors. So you see on the, the chart there, I have uh, uh, 1000 AU and that's uh, 1000 astronomical units. So that's like the distance from the Earth to the sun is one astronomical unit. And if you stack that up a thousand times, and that's something that's been talked about in the literature uh, as an interstellar precursor. To kind of put that in context, uh, the Voyager spacecraft, I believe, is like at 145 astronomical units, and it took it, uh, you know, the better part uh, of uh, 40 years to get out to that point. So uh, that's really far out, but it's definitely not interstellar, right? Uh, uh, Alpha Centauri is about 270,000 astronomical units, so NEP will not enable uh, interstellar in the practical sense. Uh, now, if we move to the right a little bit into the unknown, at least on the engineering side of things, uh, we could potentially replace the, uh, uh, the fission-based reactor with a fusion-based reactor and change from NEP to FEP, so fusion electric propulsion. So the power system is now burning deuterium and tritium, uh, to generate electricity that then could be fed to the same type of uh, electric electric thrusters. Alternately, another approach would be uh, something we call direct fusion. So instead of having you know a thermodynamic cycle that's trying to convert the heat from the the fusion reactor to electricity, uh, we would just simply uh, use the reaction process and and exhaust the uh, uh, the ash out of the back of the reactor as a form of thrust. Uh, now, the power levels for this are going to be higher than they are for nuclear electric propulsion, right? We're getting into an appreciable fraction of, of a gigawatt. Um, so this definitely enables uh, what I call fast human uh, exploration of the outer solar system, right? And this is actually, if anyone's watched the TV show Expanse, that's the, the big propulsion scheme they used in all those spaceships is a fusion-based type of approach. And of course, fusion is also discussed in the literature as some of the ways to try and do an interstellar mission. And I, I say slow uh, because we're talking 50 years to 100 years or more uh, to be able to send a, a large spacecraft from Earth to another, another star system. Uh, but fusion would enable that. You can actually achieve appreciable uh, fractions of the speed of light, at, uh, like 0.1 uh, uh, of the speed of light and be able to get to an interstellar destination in, in uh, in a time that's very different from some of the things we think about now. And this is based on known physics. We just don't have the engineering figured out because we don't have, uh, uh, you know, terrestrial fusion reactors that are providing power to the grid. Uh, but I think that's actually a lot closer uh, than what it's typically been uh, uh, thought about in the past. I, I think there's some big, some significant improvements in uh, superconducting magnets to increase the magnetic fields that we can generate. So well, I can answer questions about that later if, if you're interested. Uh, and then we move to the rightmost swim lane, and this is what I call breakthrough. And this is where on the frontiers of physics, right, uh, as we try and uncover a, a better understanding of physics, will we discover new mathematical models uh, that help us uh, figure out how to do things like the idea of, of a space drive. Can we interact with space time itself or the quantum vacuum and, and be able to provide a, a, you know, a motive force on a spacecraft and allow it to uh, input delta V into the spacecraft? Can we figure out how to implement the idea of a wormhole or a space warp? We, we know general relativity says they're mathematically possible, but you know, what do we need to put together to try and make something like that to physically real, if you will? Right, uh, you know, if you think about physics as a Venn diagram, there's there's really uh, two circles, if you will. You've got uh, in one circle, you've got the words, um, you know, quantum mechanics, and that represents our understanding of the, the microscopic world, and and that gives us cell phones. Uh, and in the other circle, you've got the words general relativity, and that represents the macroscopic world, how the stars move, and so forth. And that also gives us GPS. So. Just that level of understanding of physics gives us, you know, cell phones with GPS. We can go navigate to go meet a friend at a restaurant uh, that we've never been to before. Uh, so just that level of physics touches our lives every single day. But because these two circles don't fully overlap, we know there has to be a more generalized understanding to be developed. Uh, and in the process of uncovering that uh, uh, more generalized understanding, it's going to provide us new opportunities for technologies that we really haven't even conceived of today. So just a quick overview of, of the things that we're doing to try and chase uh, that pinnacle objective. Uh, this is a, a list of our programs that we have. We have um, 
uh, you know, research and development. Uh, we do internal research and development through our our, our lab called Eagle Works. Uh, and so currently we're funded by DARPA Defense Science Office uh, doing some uh, foundations of physics work. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, we have something we call Interstellar Initiative Grants. That's a, a solicitation we, re we released uh, in the summer of last year for uh, allowing people to write proposals for research topics. Uh, and we selected um, nine teams from across the world. I'll talk a little bit more about those in just a second, kind of covering some things like beamed energy propulsion, fusion, all the way up to wormholes. And I'll talk real quickly about uh, each one of those in, in a few minutes. Uh, we have something we call university partnerships. So we just signed a deal with the Texas A&M uh, to try and develop a, a, a compact nuclear reactor. Again, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, we do have student programs, of course, with, with COVID that's uh, slowed things down in terms of uh, uh, having some interns here at the office with us. But uh, uh, this summer will be, uh, last summer we did a student paper contest, but uh, uh, to answer the question you see there, but this summer uh, we're going to be commissioning a, a week-long class for undergraduates uh, to take uh, associated with just kind of thinking about interstellar and all the physics and engineering associated with interstellar. So if you have any interest with that, uh, maybe uh, check back with our website from time to time as we, we get the, the details to finalized. This is our this is our NASCAR chart. This shows that even in our, our brief period of existence, uh, you know, we've managed to, to build a lot of good connections with a lot of teams uh, all across the world. Uh, we hope to continue to grow this uh, this NASCAR chart. So definitely a, a heavy, uh, heavy emphasis on connections with uh, academia uh, and, uh, you know, student uh, student research in, in all these universities. There are students involved in the research. Uh, and so that's definitely what we're what we're about. Right. This this cutting edge research. Uh, does typically tend to have a, a strong connection with with academia, uh, which means that we have lots of opportunities for students to get involved. So the work that we're doing for DARPA <clears throat> is exploring a, a fundamental physics model we called uh, we call the dynamic vacuum model. Uh, and so the the physics models that we've been working on for a while uh, suggest that we may be able to uh, uh, design some design and manufacture some very tiny customized casimir cavities. Uh, that may provide ways for us to generate uh, small amounts of persistent power. Uh, we may be able to uh, do something we call increase the negative vacuum energy density. That actually is something that's pertinent to the idea of, of a space warp. Uh, this also potentially has some communications implications, uh, and it may provide new ways to build sensors uh, using a different form of radiation that we we're, we've typically not considered in the past. Uh, and it may also provide the ability to generate thrust for a spacecraft. And so you see some little cartoons there of some of the initial concepts uh, for uh, uh, these customized casimir cavities in, in, in the form of these, like these plates that are very close to one another with these pillar, pillar like structures that are shown in red uh, in between them. Uh, and so the, this is the work that we've been doing for DARPA to try and understand A, can we manufacture these things? Uh, how do we experimentally measure them? And then uh, really enhancing the numerical models to kind of uh, uh, have a really good handle on what we can expect to see when we go through and do the measurement. I'll, I'll show a picture of some of the, the latest uh, constructions in a minute. Just a little bit of background on the dynamic vacuum model itself. Uh, and so this is, again, this is getting into that to rightmost swim lane, the frontiers of physics. We're trying to, these two circles that don't overlap, they only just kind of touch. We're trying to figure out, is this a candidate that might help cover some of this area that's not uh, encapsulated by those two circles? So the dynamic vacuum model is it's categorized as a pilot wave theory. Uh, there's several pilot wave theories, but the dynamic vacuum one is our specific approach, if you will. Uh, we maintain that the vacuum is a dynamic medium. It can vary in space and time, uh, and therefore uh, whatever it's made of can sustain longitudinal wave modes. And so this is a very significant uh, uh, a statement to make. Uh, and so as a result of it being able to sustain longitudinal wave modes, uh, it can also, the, whatever the, the medium is made of, it can exchange the, the, the constituents that make it up, the little bits that make it up, are capable of exchanging energy and momentum. Now, in terms of trying to understand the, the, uh, the validity of the dynamic vacuum model, there's a lot of data we can look at already without having to conduct experiments, such as, you know, electron orbitals. There's been a lot of work in quantum mechanics to uh, quantify all the electron orbitals, their energy levels, molecular chemistry, uh, we can look at uh, nuclear physics, and so we've done a lot of that in some of our previous work, work we did for, for DARPA, uh, modeling the hydrogen atom. Uh, we derived the acoustic uh, wave equation uh, from the Schrodinger equation, so that's a very, very significant uh, 
development uh, in the physics world that we can we can show that deep connection and really uh, support our, our claim that uh, the quantum vacuum is a dynamic medium, number one. Number two, electron orbitals are acoustic resonances in this dynamic vacuum medium. And so we built models of the hydrogen atom. And we were able to show the, the S orbital, P orbital, D orbital, uh, F orbitals uh, with the exact energy levels that they're supposed to have. And we also extended the modeling approach uh, to chemistry to model molecular hydrogen. Uh, this is all published in, in Physics Open. Uh, it's available, you know, it's uh, uh, it's not behind a paywall, so you can actually download the paper if you're interested. Uh, we did some uh, uh, some extending work leaning forward. Uh, we've long held to the fact that uh, gravity is potentially an emergent phenomena, and so uh, we extended our modeling technique to build a dynamic vacuum model of the sun's gravitational potential. Uh, and then in the process of modeling the eigenfrequencies of this system, uh, when we compared the eigenfrequencies to the system, the eigenfrequencies matched uh, the known orbits for the, the planets in our solar system. So this potentially suggests to us that uh, gravity may have a soft quantization characteristic. Sorry, was somebody talking? Okay, uh, <clears throat> so we, we suspect that uh, the gravity may be soft quantized. And so one of the things we want to do is maybe look at the exoplanet database and look at, uh, you know, there's a number of stars with planets at different locations, and we can build models for each one of those stars and then go through and, and see, is there a correlation with uh, the eigenfrequencies that our model predicts with the, the, the known orbital parameters of the exoplanets that have been confirmed? Uh, and so that's something we'd like to go do, because what they could do <clears throat> is for the exoplanet community, it maybe could help them uh, focus in their search into specific frequency bins, if you will. All right, if, if we can show that uh, gravity does have this soft quantization characteristic, uh, that might be very useful just from the exoplanet science perspective. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're definitely about to the technological aspect. We want to try and figure out how to apply this physics in a way that uh, allows us to trace back to that uh, power and propulsion objective. Uh, and so we've been working with uh, Texas A&M and Isentis uh, to try and manufacture some very tiny nanofabrication uh, devices. You see some, uh, you see a nice picture there in the up, upper right. This is uh, from a, a, a nanoscribe 3D printer up at uh, Texas A&M. Uh, we've managed to achieve close to the target separation of the gap here, and you see these nice pillar structures that are in between, uh, and this has been fully metallized, uh, and we've done some assay to go through and confirm that it's metallized. Uh, so this has been very encouraging from a manufacturing perspective. On the analytical front, <clears throat> you know, we use something we call the numeric world line technique to predict the, uh, the distribution of negative vacuum energy density in these casimir cavities. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of an analytic monster, uh, maybe even more so than CFD, uh, but uh, we've got uh, some cluster computational capability to allow us to be able to go through and do uh, three-dimensional analysis of some complicated structures. Uh, and so this little picture right here uh, shows the predicted negative vacuum energy density for this particular cavity, if you will, kind of looking at uh, uh, one of these pillars and just a little area around it. Uh, you kind of see that uh, there's these <coughs> concentrations on either side, but what we're most interested in <clears throat> is this field that goes through the middle of the pillar itself. We're trying to measure the field in the middle, and so that pillar is put there for that reason. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that the, the perturbation of the quantum vacuum uh, actually went all the way through the pillar uh, and that the pillar did not like screen itself from the, the perturbation of the vacuum. And so uh, that was a very encouraging find for us that. Uh, uh, the, the spatial variation that we think exists in these Casimir cavities, that signature is predicted to exist in those pillars. So that's that's very, uh, very useful for us. Now, this is where uh, I want to switch gears for just a second before I start talking about the I-squared grants. Um, the interesting thing about this is that that finding was very significant, not only for our DARPA work, but it was related to something uh, that we were not researching at the time. Uh, I'm going to jump over this next chart. This just talks about we'll be using an, an atomic force microscope and uh, some sensitive electronics to try and measure it. But let me let me get to this uh, uh, unexpected finding that we had as a result of that analysis of the plate pillar system. And the, the previous graph I showed you was a log graph. We're trying to highlight uh, uh, the differences. This is a, a linear plot, if you will. So you can still see the pillar here. This is now the edge of the plate, and that's the edge of the plate. This, in, this negative vacuum energy density distribution looked very similar to us to something that we're familiar with uh, when, we, when you think about the idea of a space warp. 
When you think about the idea of a space warp, you've got this little plot here that shows this uh, uh, expansion and contraction of space time the we call the York time, uh, and that's predicted uh, to be a, a response to the presence of this ring. You see in the little gray cartoon spacecraft there, this ring of negative vacuum energy density. Uh, and so when you look at what the field equations require, right, for the Alcubierre uh, warp metric, you have this uh, fairly similar two dimensional plot. But the main difference between these two <clears throat> is that uh, this is these are pillar like uh, they're not toroidal, whereas this bottom plot uh, is toroidal. So we we speculated that we could come up with a, a slightly different topology than our plate pillar. And so we ended up looking at a in this case, a four micron cylinder surrounding a one micron diameter sphere. Uh, and then we used our numeric world line technique to do the, uh, the, the analysis of the system. And so now you see this toroidal ring of negative vacuum energy density. Uh, and so this definitely says uh, this will generate a nanoscale warp bubble, a real nanoscale warp bubble. Now it's it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to do anything. It's, you know, it's just going to sit there at the lab, uh, but it's definitely going to have different optics properties. Uh, and so that at a minimum is, is of extreme interest to us, number one. Number two, as a matter of precedence, to be able to say, and we have a paper in, in peer review right now, to be able to say in the literature that we can now propose to the community that there's a physical structure that one could build that would manifest a nanoscale warp bubble, that's that's very significant. So, But but don't get too excited. It's cool, but it's, it's not going to go anywhere and, and do anything. Um, but I think the corollary with this is that we were doing the research for a totally different purpose, and this was an unanticipated finding. Uh, and so one of the things DARPA wants us to look at is to try and figure out, can we come up with some experiments to try and measure the optical properties of this type of a system? So you see this little cartoon of four micron cylinders with a one micron sphere with an open bore down the center. Maybe we would shoot electrons through it or something like that uh, to try and see if we can't measure uh, a, a signature in the lab. Uh, I don't know that we can or not yet. We're still trying to evaluate that. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the research that we're funding externally. Uh, as I said, we commissioned interstellar initiative grants during the summer in partnership with the breakthrough initiatives and again with Texas A&M. Uh, the, the operating uh, approach for this is we'll do this uh, every two years. Uh, and the anticipation is, is that grant winners will have a 12 month period of performance. Uh, we have kind of two categories, something we call a tactical grant for uh, up to about 100K worth of award. It's anticipated that that would be uh, like a paper study, maybe a little bit of experimentation if it's a mature lab. Uh, and then we have a category we call a strategic grant, uh, and that's where we would allow for awards up to 250K, and that's where we're anticipating that would be coupled with experimentation. I'll just step you through real quick of the, the, the nine grant performers that we uh, we funded. Uh, Professor Phil Lubin at uh, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, he's doing some work for us on directed energy uh, for space propulsion and power. Uh, this is where you've got uh, some kind of a beaming system that beams power to a, a re remote location and then a spacecraft would turn that uh, power into whether it's propulsion or whatever purposes that it needs. It allows you to have a payload at home and, and send the power to a, a remote spacecraft. And so one of the things that uh, Phil's doing for us is coming up with a scenario where he has uh, uh, he has three, uh, uh, three beaming elements talking to a single target over a very large distance. Uh, and so they've been conducting some work in the lab on that already. Uh, they anticipate maybe being able to do an experiment with uh, intuitive machines Nova C spacecraft where they could potentially have a, a phasing beacon on that spacecraft and then have a, a 10 meter sparse array of these elements that they've already got the design worked out for uh, and beam a signal to the Nova C. Now the, the 10 meter sparse array is not enough to put uh, useful power on the spacecraft, but it will create a diffraction pattern on the lunar regolith, right, where you'll see using an infrared camera, you'll see these little spots that are a result of the diffraction pattern. Uh, where the lunar regolith is being heated up. So that would certainly be a very uh, interesting experiment to go try and conduct. Uh, next up, we have uh, our Professor Richard Norti from uh, uh, Delft University of Technology over in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, they're working on trying to uh, mature some photonic crystal uh, sail concepts that they're exploring. When you think about uh, like Breakthrough Starshot, um, uh, uh, the mission where they're they're planning on beaming a solar sail with a, a bunch of power to try and get it up to 20% the speed of light. Um, you have to have the ability to tolerate the, the, the change in perception of the wavelength of the beaming source because you're getting to, you know, 20% the speed of light and so relativity will start to make an, an impact. And so this sail has to be highly reflective over that full range of anticipated uh, uh, 
uh, relative wavelength, if you will. And so some of the work that uh, Richard is doing is trying to figure out what type of topological structures can you implement that make that system uh, be able to support that kind of objective. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Professor Ray Sedwick uh, working on fusion at University of Maryland. Uh, he has something, uh, uh, it's kind of a, uh, uses a, an E cross B shear flow stabilization. Uh, and instead of trying to focus on using the neutrons for power generation through some type of thermodynamic cycle, uh, they're focusing on using the, uh, the alpha particles uh, for both uh, the power and for uh, generating the, the thrust from the system. Uh, and so we're helping them uh, improve the mathematical models. You see some of the progress uh, shown there already. Uh, we're funding uh, Professor Jason Cassabri and uh, uh, Gabe Zhu at uh, University of Alabama Huntsville for a, a pulsed type of fusion approach. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at the little puddle plots here, this puddle plot on the left uh, shows that uh, with the, um, uh, the particular power levels that they're capable of reaching, uh, they may be able to explore this area here and they want to get into this yellow area. And so we're we're funding the development of the uh, experimentation process to try and understand the scaling of their approach. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Kelvin Long from Interstellar Research Center is working on a uh, uh, inertial confinement fusion ignition of a fuel pellet. This is kind of the approach that's typically been looked at for uh, Daedalus. You see a picture up there on the top left. Uh, and so he's got a lot of experience working with this uh, in the past. Uh, he's trying to, uh, uh, you know, provide a comprehensive software suite that we can use to evaluate all the historical concepts and any future concepts to go through and have a better, uh, higher fidelity assessment of some of the predicted mission performance of those systems. Uh, we're, fund we're funding um, uh, Sethion Hugh at uh, uh, Holicity Space in partnership with Caltech and the University of Maryland, Baltimore County on a, a new type of uh, fusion propulsion approach that uses something called a plectoneme. It's a peculiar word, but it's just a uh, kind of a plasma donut, if you will. You can see on the uh, the top picture here, that's an experiment they did at Caltech to go through and show the st stable formation of a plectoneme. Uh, and so this might provide a way to have a fusion system, fusion propulsion system uh, that doesn't necessarily have to provide net power, but it just might be able to augment uh, power that's provided by the spacecraft to get a, a, a more effective thrust to power ratio, if you will. Uh, we're funding uh, Professor John Bush at uh, MIT on uh, uh, something called hydrodynamic quantum field theory, uh, trying to explore through another pilot wave model, are there ways that one could potentially push off of the quantum vacuum? And so he's doing a bunch of work to try and uh, study that and, and, and improve his models from 2D to 3D. Um, we're also funding in that same area of kind of a space drive category, uh, Charles Chase at uh, UNLAB and uh, uh, Professor Yuval Dagon at uh, Technion Israel Institute of Technology uh, to look at uh, some asymmetric potentials that uh, are predicted to be manifest in something called a resonant tunneling diode. Uh, and they believe that uh, certain types of constructions may result in a slightly asymmetric uh, thrust as a result of vacuum fluctuations across the potential. Uh, and so they're looking at the, you know, how do they establish the manufacturing capabilities uh, and then what can be the magnitude of signal that they might be able to detect or measure. Uh, and then finally, we're funding Professor Remo Garantini at uh, University of Bergamo in Italy. Uh, he's well published in the literature on ideas of uh, uh, wormholes. And so he's trying to figure out, are there ways to improve the magnitude of the, the Casimir, the negative vacuum energy density uh, that's uh, coupled to the Casimir phenomena, and then maybe test some additional mathematical models to come up with a more efficient uh, traversable wormhole. So that's the I-squared grants. This is my last chart. Um, we are, as I said, uh, partnering with the Texas A&M to develop a compact nuclear reactor in like the one to 10 megawatt electric range. Uh, and so this is something we'd want to fit into a like a 40 foot shipping container. Um, and we we're we're specifically constraining the design a little differently from there's a parallel DOD program called the Pele program, uh, but they're only looking for terrestrial applications only. We want to see can we come up with a design that satisfies all the requirements for the DOD Pele program, but also would be forward compatible with being used in space, right? If we want to try and make this you know, lightweight, this, you see this term 20 kilograms per kilowatt, try and make it lightweight uh, and then make it so that it could be adapted with a minimal amount of change to be able to be used in a space environment, right? Can we achieve that? What does that reactor look like? And does that help uh, policy discussions in the future? Uh, and so that's uh, that's the extent of my, my charts. Uh, I'll, I'll switch gears now and just talk very briefly about um, a little bit of my background, how I ended up in, in power and propulsion 
uh, maybe some lessons learned and, and advice for you guys. Um, you know, I I, um, <clears throat> I started work at uh, NASA in 2000, working in uh, uh, flight robotics, but I was always interested in power and propulsion. Uh, and that was the whole reason I went and got uh, my advanced degrees, my master's uh, in mechanical engineering, and eventually my PhD in physics uh, from Rice University. Let me uh, end my slideshow and uh, turn off my slide sharing thing so you guys can see me better. Uh, if I know how to do that. There's a, uh, There's option, a option in the top, in the top right, right corner. Right corner. Yeah, yeah, I think. Can you turn off my? There we go. All right. There we go. I stopped sharing. Can you guys see me better now? Yes, yes. OK. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, going back to my education, getting my master's in mechanical engineering and PhD in physics, you know, I worked flight robotics for many, many years, uh, certainly enjoyed being able to support human space flight in that way, um, but always thinking about uh, power propulsion. But I think what enabled me to, to shift gears is, you know, working extremely hard at being a, a good team member for, for the flight robotics team. You know, I got a lot of opportunities to, to meet stakeholders and establish credibility with, with them and other communities. Uh, and so just with whatever I was given, I tried to be very faithful um, and, a, you know, a, a good worker and a good team member. And so I think that helped open doors for me later that allowed me to shift over into the uh, the power and pro power and propulsion regime uh, and, and eventually start to take a leadership role uh, uh, for the agency for, for human spaceflight. Uh, so it was, you know, you, you never know exactly where you're going to go. You may have something that you're extremely interested interested in that you want to where you want to land, uh, but it may not be something that you can immediately land there. And there may be a little bit of a, a, a weaving to your journey, if you will, and that's OK. Uh, because you'll, you know, good Lord willing, the skills you pick up will always feed forward into whatever you're doing in the future. Uh, so I, I think that's something to be to be mindful of as you're, you know, just starting in your careers, right? Uh, maybe keep that in, in mind. Um, lessons learned, uh, you know, I, I think maybe let me say this differently. Advice. I'll do it as as advice. You know, whatever it is that you 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 do as you move forward in your career, make sure it's something that you you really like and you really enjoy um, because you know work is work and you always have scenarios where some of the people you work with might be uh, a little challenging or some of the challenges that you're working through are very very difficult um, you know there's lots of different things that that happen in a work environment that can that can definitely tax somebody you know emotionally physically all those different things and making sure you're connected with something that you really enjoy uh, sometimes that you know that that's very helpful when you're trying to weather some of those seasons, right? They're 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 not all the time there, but they they do come, right? It's, you know, in in every life, a little rain must fall, if you will. Uh, so I think that's one thing to be to be mindful of as as you move forward. Try and make sure you're 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 connecting with something that you get a lot of fulfillment out of. I think that's that's really important, you know. And I think uh, another thing to be mindful of is it's and I I. I get I feel more and more like this as I move further in my career. Uh, it's there's a big people aspect to what you're doing, right? It's very important to form connections with people, right? And as and as scientists and engineers, sometimes we tend to be more interested in 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 the science and the math or the widget or uh, the mission or something like that. But uh, you know this this domain that we work in is very critically connected to the people that are involved. So I think it's important to to try and think about fostering relationships with people, spending some time with them, and 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 not just always talking, you know, it's not just work, 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 you know, also talk to people about, you know, their lives and the things that are going on and, and get to know your your coworkers and, and so forth. I, I think that's also very helpful as well. Uh, and so I think that's an important thing that sometimes as uh, uh, technically minded folks, maybe we forget that. Uh, so that's, that's something I think you should think about. So I think with that, I'll pause and, and just take questions. I'll start with mine. Um, when you're talking about manipulating space time, mm -hmm. is there ever the concern that if it was possible, you would run into the situation of things not going back to where they were? Like you would permanently change things for the for the worse. Like uh, I'm talking about like orbital patterns of things and stuff like that. If you came too close, 
Uh, if if I'm understanding your correction, uh, sorry, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, it's really difficult to manifest something like a, a, a space warp or a wormhole. Uh, space time is very, very, very stiff. <laughs> uh, there's a factor of C to the fourth over G, and that's a really big number. Uh, so it kind of lets you know when you're thinking about the the York time, the expansion and contraction of space. It's a, that's what drives some of the, the big numbers that you that you hear. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, I, I think if you ever figure a way to turn it on, as soon as you turn it off, it's, there's no residual hysteresis, if you will, uh, to anything. It's just it wants to be the other way, and you have to work really hard to get it to do the things that you want it to do to make a, a trick like a, a space warp or a wormhole even possible. Good question, though. Does anyone else have any questions? You can post them in the chat, and then I will call on you. Uh, Alexander, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> hi there, Dr. White. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, sure. You know, my, my question is more so, I actually, I have your wiki pulled up, but I'm just kind of looking at your educational section. I, I noticed, um, you know, after you got your master's degree, you went on to get your, uh, your doctorate in physics, and I'm a graduate student in computer science getting my master's, and I was just wondering, I'm kind of approaching the end of my master's, and I'm kind of debating within myself internally and my family whether to continue and try to aspire to get a PhD and I'm I'm wondering if you met a kind of a fork in the road similar and what decisions kind of what factors really led to you to continue on and you know would you be where you are today would you say had you not gotten your PhD <clears throat> that's a that's actually a really good question uh, Alex um, Alex or Alexander uh, Alex okay, or that's... whatever you want Alex is fine thank you okay uh, uh, <clears throat> so, you know, Alex, um, I always kind of knew where I was going to end up and I knew what kind of skills I wanted. Uh, so it's maybe a little bit of a different situation than you're talking about, but I'll answer that in a, in a second. Um, so when I was getting my master's, I was taking a lot of advanced mathematics courses, you know, tensor calculus and so forth, uh, because I knew I wanted to, uh, uh focus heavily on general relativity because I knew I wanted to, to try and uh, understand the idea of, of space warps and wormholes. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that was all connected and, and the, the master's in mechanical engineering was just that was what worked best. I was up in Wichita, uh, Kansas at the time working for Boeing, uh, getting my master's up there. And so that was the, the that just worked the best with the, the work schedule and everything else. Uh, but I knew I was going to potentially shift to physics. I knew that was kind of a, a bifurcation decision I had to make. Uh, and so uh, it took me a while when I moved down, moved up to sorry, moved down to Houston uh, to work with Lockheed Martin originally at the uh, uh, working in flight robotics. I knew I wanted to, to switch to, to physics uh, after a short period of time, and, and uh, I had done enough of the groundwork with my master's that it made that switch a little less uh, a little less uh, painful. But you you asked, you know, you're you're still kind of thinking, right? Is it graduate yes, study? Is it PhD? Where do I want to be? And so I think to answer that question, that's that's where it's good to think about, you know, what's your pinnacle objective? Where where do you think you want to be? Uh, at some point in your future career, right? If you if you want to be in research and development of any kind, right? I think probably at a minimum you should have a master's. I think that goes without saying. Um, you 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 could you might still find a way to work in research and development, but the you know, there's so much competition out there, it, it ends up being a, a maybe a really important uh, box to have checked so that when when you know the the filter process where no humans are involved, you make it past that uh, that particular. A loophole, but the the PhD. Uh, so a master's is is difficult. PhD requires an additional level of commitment because they're going to grind on you for the PhD. Uh, and so the, the 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 and it's not impossible, but it's just it's it's an extra level of hard, and you have to really love what it is that you're doing uh, so that you can survive that grind. Number one, number two. That's where I think it's really important to have that pinnacle objective established for yourself. Because you, you can see how the chess pieces fit together to try and achieve that objective, right? So if you if you want to be a principal investigator of any kind, right, working on some type of, you know, frontiers of engineering or frontiers of physics type of thing, you're probably going to need a PhD. Uh, so but and that's where having that pinnacle objective established for yourself might be useful. Now, here's another thing you could think about. Maybe you wait a while, go to work for a couple of years and see how you feel. You don't necessarily have to immediately do that. You could potentially 
uh, work a bit and then come back to it if that's what you want to do or work and go to school at the same time. That's what I did for both my master's and PhD. I worked the whole time. Yeah, and that's kind of something I've been kind of doing to get into graduate school, working full time, taking class at night. So that may be kind of the way I end up doing it. But mm -hmm. thank you so much. That that helps yeah. a lot. Sure. So I'll go ahead and ask another question while I wait for people to raise their hands. Uh, going back to the presentation, when you're looking at creating the engineering that uh, does diffusion over fission, are you looking at some, things like the Hadron Collider as uh, inspiration for designs? <clears throat> no, not really. Um, you know, the Hadron Collider is uh, doing stuff very specifically with um, uh, you know individual particles to go through and, and, and accomplish collisions. Uh, plasma physics is considerably more, uh, uh, you know, complicated, um, and hence why fusion is is so very difficult. Um, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, you just in order to work in fusion, you have to understand plasma physics very, very well. And then there's a whole bunch of subtleties of personality, if you will, when you specifically look at fusion approaches, and even that's kind of bifurcated into, well, is it magnetically confined fusion? That's like ITER or the toroidal tokamaks you've you, you maybe have seen, or is it magnetic inertial fusion? That's uh, the company General Fusion is doing that. Uh, um, uh, uh, Tri-Alpha Energy, I think, has like a, a field reversible configuration. Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory also has a, a field reversible configuration. So uh, in, in terms of plasma physics, uh, that's definitely, you know, maybe the sun would be something you'd kind of look at, but the sun is considerably less dense than what we, in terms of where it's doing fusing, is less dense than what we're trying to achieve in a fusion reactor, which is why fusion is terrestrial fusion is challenging, right? So. Thank you. Um, next question is from Michael Lopez. Uh, hello, can you can you guys hear me? Um, yep. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, thank you, Dr. White, for taking the time to speak with us again. Um, I've been uh, reading about the, uh, you know, all these advanced propulsion stuff for the past couple of weeks, and I was wondering if you guys are considering or, or, or talked about like I don't know, um, inertial mass, like tricking space time into somehow thinking you have less mass than you actually do. So it, it, it perhaps takes a bit less to move you uh, yeah, in space. That's, good. that's a good question. Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, there's a, a, gentleman, a gentleman by the name of uh, Professor Jim Woodward, uh, along with uh, Professor, uh, uh, um, oh shoot, uh, how I can't remember. I can't remember the last name. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm blanking on that. Um, but uh, they've been working with a model where they they think there's a way to uh, induce uh, transient mass fluctuations based on some wave equations that uh, Jim Woodward derived uh, years ago. And I think they've done some experimentation with that, and they won a NIAC grant, a couple of NIAC grants. Um, so there's, but the, the signal is very small. They haven't uh, they haven't established it to a point that. You know, it, it uh, has clearly uh, convinced the, the physics community that uh, there's <clears throat> that that can that can that can be valid or not. Um, so there are people that, that do think about that. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little bit further back than that. You know, I I'm uh, I, you saw from the slide that I showed you guys looking at thinking about the hydrogen atom, thinking about molecular hydrogen, modeling the proton directly. Uh, potentially, you know, gravity is an emergent phenomena. So if gravity is an emergent phenomena, and that completely, you know, it introduces a lot of questions of, well, how does that connect to inertial mass? And so that's where I think having a fundamental understanding of, of gravitation, maybe at that more fundamental level, might help uh, provide some additional insights on how somebody might use that to maybe do something that you're talking about. I don't know that that's explicitly possible or not, but uh, uh, I'm I'm a little bit further back than that. I'm I'm not too far down the road on application on that front. I just want to continue to study the gravitational field uh, and potentially look at the exoplanet database and uh, see if we can show some correlation there. And then if we can show that, then we would have confidence that that initial logic brick in this brick wall we're trying to build is is fairly stable. And then maybe we might glom another brick onto that and start to expand to another area and another area. So, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Don't while be bashful. Don't be bashful. <laughs> while, we, while we wait, I'll go ahead and ask another one. Uh, specifically career-wise, what um, 
I noticed that you you moved around in your time with various aerospace companies, but when uh, what well, what was the total time you spent at NASA, and what caused you to I guess step away to to pursue what you're doing now? Yeah, so I spent uh, four years at Boeing up in uh, Wichita, Kansas, uh, commercial aircraft. Spent uh, four years with Lockheed Martin here in Houston, working flight robotics. I crossed over to uh, civil servant uh, 2004. Uh, worked at NASA for uh, over 15 years. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, Brian B.K. Kelly called me um, and uh, said he wanted to try and stand up this uh, institute. Uh, and so Cam Gaffarian is our benefactor. Cam Gaffarian is also the, um, the co-founder of uh, Intuitive Machines, Axiom Space, uh, and X Energy. So he's definitely a, you know, another person that's very forward thinking and trying to figure out what does this next chapter of space exploration need to look like. Uh, and so it just seemed like a really perfect opportunity to uh, shift uh, role a little bit and maybe open up some additional uh, uh, doors for me in terms of things that I can do. Uh, being in a nonprofit and not being a civil servant, I can have discussions with people that I couldn't typically have had uh, working in the, in the agency. Uh, I can still, you know, work with DARPA and other government agencies to go conduct research. And then we can conduct research internally, right? We can go through and sponsor research. And that may also provide opportunities for partnerships with, with NASA in the future where we can kind of grow that type of a of an effort. And so I, I wouldn't have been able to do all of those things if I had stayed uh, inside the fence at uh, uh, JSC. It was a hard decision to be sure. Uh, you know, I went into it with a lot of thought and prayer and, and talked to a lot of folks. But at the end of the day, I think this is what the good Lord wanted me to do. So this is the path that I went down. Thank you. Next question is from Lanique. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. So I've heard in the TV program that uh, one possibility uh, for propulsion will be to use uh, uh, antimatter or uh, positrons to store store it and, and use it. Is this something that um, has been researched or considered? Uh, Yannick, that was a, a good question, and, and yes, that is a another potential uh, avenue that uh, one could consider uh, to do something like interstellar. At, at the end of the day, I think when you typically see people talk about at the detail level of one propulsion scheme versus another, I think it comes down to the efficiency of converting, you know, <clears throat> onboard matter into delta V of the spacecraft, and and matter antimatter uh, potentially is a very very efficient approach uh, uh, to do that. Uh, the three swim lane thing that you see me see me present during today's discussion uh, that's tailored to keep that discussion simple uh, when you talk to stakeholders that don't necessarily have the full depth of understanding of the different options uh, that tends to take a very complicated subject and boil it down to something that they can digest uh, and come away with at least a, a good level of insight but yes uh, antimatter would potentially be like a, a little star in that middle swim lane Right where uh, that would be an alternate uh, approach that could still enable uh, potentially interstellar because it has the capacity to achieve similar performance to fusion. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Jeevan. Hey, Sonny, it's a very interesting time. Quick question, uh, and it's related to advice to you. Um, I know you've had a very diverse background and you span multiple domains. Was it part of like a master plan that you had thought about and knew you were in target? Or I'm sure like a lot of people you had crossroads to come to and you had to evaluate and, and decide which path to take. For people that as they develop their career, new opportunities appear, how to objectively Look at it and evaluate it and make a decision that matters. Just walk down, you know, one of those decision gates. Okay, Gene, I, I think I got uh, uh, enough of that uh, to to be able to tell what your question. The the sound was broken up pretty good, so if I missed a point you were trying to make, I, I'm I'm sorry. Um, it, it, if if I could paraphrase what you said, you know, how do the different Lego bricks of of my personal journey fit together to? Uh, where I'm at uh, and what I'm doing and you know are some Lego bricks different colors than others uh, even though I might prefer the the blue Lego brick swim lane or whatever um, you know I, I think uh, as I said before wherever I was placed with whatever opportunity I had I tried to make sure I leaned into it as much as I could 
because uh, at the end of the day, sometimes it's just like, you know, being an engineer and a scientist, that the, the most base level of, of currency in our world is if a, if a problem is challenging and interesting, well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fun dog bone to chew on. We're going to chew on it and, and go do it. And so while it, uh, maybe you have some type of a, a, a daydream where you want to be you know, the, the head of the physics department at uh, Notre Dame, I'm, I'm making stuff up, but uh, you're currently somewhere else doing something else. Um, certainly where you're at and what you're doing, make sure you're leaning into that as much as you can. And there'll be opportunities to try and you know, uh, explore your intellectual curiosity and so forth. Uh, but definitely, you know, having a pinnacle objective maybe helps you figure out the different chess pieces you want to move in different ways to help maybe get you closer and closer uh, to that uh, final destination. Uh, so, you know, never don't be disappointed if you're not exactly where you want to be on your first day out of college uh, with, with some company. Um, you know, you you can get to where you want to go, but make sure you're you're contributing where you're at and you're building up credibility with your stakeholders, building networks, because you know that'll provide opportunities. And I think one one additional piece of advice that this makes me think about is, um, I think it's very important if you can get your hands on, you know, hardware of some kind. And when I say hardware, whether it's um, you know building some structures for something or doing uh, computer circuitry for something, code for something, where you're part of a team that's making something to. Um, uh, accomplish some particular objective, right? And it's not just a paper PowerPoint where you never find yourself in a lab soldering, cutting, drilling, or doing something, or at least being connected to a team that's that's doing that for you. Uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I think that helped me be very competitive in my career was actually a lot of time I spent at uh, Boeing up in uh, Wichita, Kansas. You know, we were working on commercial aircraft, and at the time we were doing the, the 737, standing up the 737X program, and it was basically, you know, building the factory from scratch, putting in big robots and <clears throat> uh, getting the, the assembly line uh, accelerated to the point that it could produce a, a, a 737 every, you know, about seven hours. Uh, so it was a lot of work, a lot of time. Uh, but I, I tell you, I learned so much uh, about uh, making, you know, aerospace things uh, and understanding some of the chaos that's associated with that. Sometimes people are, are um, a bit gobsmacked when they get hit with, uh, when you're trying to make something that never existed before. The amount of chaos sometimes that comes with that can be a little disconcerting, especially just coming from an academic uh, 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 starting point, you know, where you're just doing, you got homework problems, you got projects that are, they're very clean and tend to be, you know, uh, a, a little bit more orderly. So I think if you can find opportunities to work on, you know, uh, hardware development of any kind, some kind of cradle to grave thing, you might you might want to do that. So. Really good advice, Sonny. Thanks. Uh, just as a follow on, I think you said a little broke up. Is there uh, do you see um, the possibility that sometimes what you vision as your end game and your pinnacle objective might need to shift because you didn't have enough information to make the right decision? You know, early on in your career, or or do you think you should stay with with your core belief and objectives and and try to you know work to that to that position or that opportunity um, as your ultimate goal? John, that's a great question. I I, I think you're I I think you're right to, to to ask that specific question. Right. Sometimes you do need to be open to, you know, changing your perspective. Maybe you've missed something or you haven't thought about something right. So every once in a while, it's OK to maybe kind of go back and do a self-assessment and, and figure out, you know, this is this has been my pinnacle objective in in my you know, in my experience and interactions with people. Do I have new information that makes me think, you know, that was interesting, but wow, this really kind of this resonates with me and I connect with this and so you might have something that has, you know, it has uh, currency with your spirit, if you will. And and you so, yeah, definitely be open to sometimes changing. Um, but I mean, you know, everyone's different and they know what uh, speaks to their heart. Right. And so, um, yeah. Great question. Yeah, very good points. Thanks. So final question will be from Ruth. 
Uh, hi, Dr. White. Thank you for talking to us today. I was just curious with your um, background since you've been in academia and then industry and then also in the government side, um, what are some maybe pros and cons of um, or challenges maybe um, in each realm um, that you look at in? Um, you know, it, every job, whichever particular hat you're wearing, is always going to have grind to it, if you will. Um, when I was a civil servant, I would tell you know some of the interns and, and co-ops that would uh, come work with us in the lab. You know, working in a, a big government organization, uh, you're a little gear in a big machine, right? And and occasionally, because of the the impersonal nature of the big machine. Some things are going to happen so that it, it grinds you down to a toothless nub and this, the, this, the machine starts turning it away and it just grinds you down uh, and it's not personal. It's just sometimes that's a, a, you know, a consequence of working in a big a government bureaucracy. Uh, you just have to you know, pick yourself up, uh, dust yourself off and, and, and keep moving forward. Uh, so that's kind of a, a government aspect of things. Um, working in the, in the commercial sector, uh, you know, you've got um, it's different stresses. Uh, the, the organization is not funded by the U.S. government in a, in a way that's like, you know, in perpetuity. You have to be, you know, the, 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 I, I say when you, when you work in the aerospace sector, sometimes you have to learn to live with your head on a swivel, to be keeping your eyes open for any, uh, you know, turn of economic events that might uh, uh, make your, your job and your position a little, a little in question. So that's something from the commercial sector perspective. Academia. Uh, you know, academia, you have a lot of personality, very strong personalities. Uh, so that's something to be prepared for uh, working in academia. But I guess technically you'd have some strong personalities in, in NASA as well. But the, the academic ones are, are unique. Uh, so, yeah, each one has different challenges to be mindful of. Um, but that's why I said at the very, be you know, very beginning of, of some of this discussion, whatever you're doing, make sure you love it in some way, because that'll help you uh, weather the storms. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you, Dr. White, for uh, taking the time to go over all of this with us and share your experiences. Uh, it's been a real honor to hear all of this and to have this chance to meet you, sir. Well, sure thing, Mike. Appreciate you guys reaching out and asking me to do this. Happy to support. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Jimmy. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and uh, everyone have a great rest of your day.